Toshiba has recently revealed a superconducting 2 megawatt motor. It's very compact and less than one tenth the weight of a conventional motor. But is this a technological breakthrough or merely a overhyped press release? To understand how this motor works, we have to look at two different things, including superconductivity and synchronous motors. Superconductivity was a pretty incredible discovery because it has game-changing applications. It's not just limited to motors and it can be used in anything from controlled fusion reactors to quantum computers and levitating trains. This phenomenon was discovered quite a while ago in 1911 by Mr. Onis, and he found out that certain metals, like mercury, can exhibit zero electrical resistance when cooled down to very low temperatures. Electrons form Cooper pairs and these move around without any friction. But there is a catch, and these were type 1 superconductors where they would actually transition back to a normal state with a certain amount of current. They also needed to be cooled down to this extreme temperature, roughly 4 Kelvin or minus 270 degrees Celsius. And in order to achieve these temperatures, you needed complex cryogenic equipment along with rare elements including liquid helium. So in order to use this in a useful machine, it needs to have a very complex dynamic which can make this all work. One excellent example is an MRI machine. Without cooling, liquid helium would vaporize out through safety valves costing thousands of dollars and damaging the magnet. So there needs to be a buffer and an MRI chiller condenses liquid helium before absorbing this heat. But all this cooling can enable a powerful superconducting magnet and this can produce a strong magnetic field that forces protons in the body to align with that field. Both the MRI machine and superconducting motors share a similar problem. They both need a superconducting magnet. And so far these components have to be cooled to a very extreme temperature. So that means that there is more cryogenic cooling, complexity, and cost. So fortunately there are materials coming out which can superconduct at higher temperatures, including this YBCO at minus 196 degrees Celsius, which is a lot better than minus 268. And another thing too is that this only requires liquid nitrogen, which is a lot more plentiful, well, at least on Earth, compared to liquid helium. And even though I have this YBCO, it's only the first part of the building block when it comes to a superconducting coil because we have to make this into a wire. Since it has zero electrical resistance without any power loss, this can handle high amounts of amperage. This is a very tricky challenge because you need something which is flexible so that it can be wound into coils but also retain the temperatures needed to superconduct. There are a few different superconducting wires out there, including magnesium diboride and the classic niboium titanium. But the more recent and notable discovery is the HTS wire. This is a breakthrough because it can superconduct at higher temperatures. So less cooling is required and you can use liquid nitrogen instead of liquid helium. Tokamak Energy has built a very powerful coil out of HTS and it can produce around 20 Tesla. But these types of coils are not just limited to fusion energy research projects, and they can be actually applied to superconducting motors. A synchronous motor would be an excellent candidate for incorporating this HTS wire. Synchronous means that the rotor rotates at the same speed as the revolving magnetic field in the machine. The shaft is aligned with the frequency of the supply current. And the main advantage of these motors is that they are highly efficient, up to 90%. They operate at constant speed and they are synchronized to the AC power supply. So if you can replace the copper windings in the synchronous motor with non-resistant HTS coils, then you can have a very high current lightweight motor. Ultimately, a superconducting synchronous motor can achieve 99% efficiency, which is basically unheard of. The ACU Med project has shed light on how difficult it is actually to make these motors. The rotor cryostat is always moving, so it needs to be perfectly sealed with a defined operating temperature. So it's provided with a forced circulation of gaseous helium at 25 Kelvin or minus 248 degrees Celsius. This may seem like taking a step back because it's being cooled far below the threshold of an HTS wire, but it's adding flexibility to the system. And ironically, an HTS can handle higher amperage at cooler temperatures. The Toshiba prototype is still a bit of a mystery because we don't exactly have any official specifications on how it's cooling this motor. 
But according to the release, it's a 2 megawatt prototype that is only half a meter wide and it only weighs a few hundred kilograms. It can be used in a variety of applications including propulsion drives or even a power generation unit. There is almost zero energy loss and there could be thousands of dollars saved. But we should have skepticism behind this kind of claim because in its current state there is a lot of energy being used for cryogenic cooling. It is also complex, but this can be simplified with a higher temperature superconducting material. There is a lot of research being poured into finding a superconducting material at room temperature. And if we do find an answer to this riddle, then the superconducting motor could be a very revolutionary technology in the future. But more importantly, I would like to know what you think. So please leave a comment, like the video if you enjoyed it, and also make sure to subscribe to my channel.